Hi there. Thanks for listening to Composer Code, the podcast dedicated to helping you succeed as a video game composer. Right on the heels of my interview with Gordy Hab, today I'm chatting with another seasoned film turned game composer, Gary Scheiman. He's best known for his incredible work on the Bioshock series, but his credits extend way beyond that. In our conversation, he broke down his composing process, which is more about him finding a sonic environment than a specific melody or harmony. I thought that was super cool. He talked about some of the specific techniques he uses to achieve that creepy atmosphere in Bioshock, and he made a really compelling argument for why all composers should learn to handwrite scores. If you're at all interested in learning to tame the mighty orchestra, then this is a conversation you're not going to want to miss. I hope you enjoy this value-packed interview with Gary Scheiman. Um, you know, many people are obviously going to know you from the Bioshock series, uh, but when you look at your IMDb, you have a long legacy of film scoring. So I'm, I'm super curious how that transition happened from film to games. Yeah, well, um, I when I started in the 80s, um, games weren't really even an opportunity for composers interested in writing film or television music. It, it just, you know, the, those were primitive times with terms of the technology. <clears throat> so it wasn't even something I was remotely, it'd be like some technology that hadn't been invented yet. It would be impossible to predict. You know? Sure. So, yeah, I mean, I came out of USC. I studied music composition at the University of Southern California, which is where I teach uh, a cl- one class now in, in the screen scoring department there. And um, I really wanted to score films and television. That was really my goal, just to, to, to write music for film and TV. And um, I got my opportunity um, working for a pair of composers named Mike Post and Pete Carpenter. And they were very, very successful television composers, and they were, they were they had so many television shows going on that they were hiring ghost composers to help out because it was just oh, the burden was just beyond um, anything they could do themselves. And so I, I amazingly got an opportunity to meet them and got started writing music for television shows like The A Team and Greatest American Hero and Magnum PI and stuff successful shows in the 80s you know and that was just all paper and pencil and orchestra and you, sh- you write it on monday through thursday and you record it on friday and then you start all over again so those those were great opportunities for a young composer coming out of uh the university and uh i loved it um in the early 90s i had a video game close encounter shall we say um i, I a friend of mine um started uh, working for Philips Interactive. Philips Interactive had a technology called CDI, uh, CD Interactive. <clears throat> and uh, the, because of the way the technology functioned, uh, basically it was, it was like a movie tree, you know, that you, you would make decisions, you know, and, and it, it, depending on the decision you made would depend on the movie you would see. So basically they were, they were making little vignettes uh, with real live actors and they needed them scored. So for me, it wasn't that different. Matter of fact, it wasn't different at all from scoring a film or a television show. Um, so that was in the early 1993, 94. And I did actually, the thing that made that viable for a composer like myself was prior to that, prior to that CDI technology, um, game scores were essentially uh, MIDI, which is this uh, digital technology that permits you to trigger certain notes. Um, being sent to in-game synth engines, and it was it was pretty simple. I mean, it wasn't it, you couldn't have full stereophonic recorded music, you know. So mm-hmm. this CDI technology permitted that. So I recorded for an orchestra for um, games like Boyer, and uh, then it got um, it got incorporated into those those games. Um, and that was a really fun opportunity, but it really wasn't my focus. Games in the early '90s were not was worse um, in terms of opportunity for composers. Were sort of a, just a sideshow. It, it really wasn't the main. There wasn't a lot of excitement in game, uh, games for composers. So that I, I didn't focus on it or you know really go for it. And and then um, the technology started to change in the late 90s, early 2000s with the PlayStation and the Xbox. 
Um, but even then, I wasn't focused on it. But really, just by happenstance, uh, my agent at the time uh, uh, contacted a big publisher called THQ. THQ is now out of business. But they were um, making a game called Destroy All Humans. And they wanted something that sounded like the famous film composer Bernard Herrmann. Because mm-hmm. it was like a 50s sci-fi game. You know, mm-hmm. know, you know about that game, but... Yeah, I do. I listen to the soundtrack. It's fantastic. Thank you. Um, You basically play an alien coming to Earth in the 1950s. And so they wanted this sort of like a retro score from the 50s, 1950s, you know, film score. uh, Bernard Herrmann. And I have some music that was written in the style of Bernard Herrmann because I was was and and remain a huge fan of his music. Mm. And so I sent them that and they go, wow, this is great. So I eventually got hired for that. And upon because I wasn't a gamer at that time certainly and so eventually i'm or or i was like as soon as i started getting into it i was like really blown away about where the technology had gone since um you know since pong (laughs) you know the 80s i was like holy cow this is amazing Mm -hmm. so i was really and and i really loved working on the project i loved the people I, i work with I and I thought the music was fun to write, and they gave me an orchestra. And at that time, I was doing a lot of TV movies. There wasn't a lot of budget for orchestra. As a matter of fact, there was, only, there was almost no budget for orchestra. So all of a sudden, I had this budget, and I could write for an orchestra and record. And that was really, really uh, interesting and attractive to me. So yeah. So that was just really um, the thing that sort of triggered my real interest, and I started focusing on opportunities in gaming and. Uh, the audio director for Destroy All Humans happened to go to Irrational Games uh, about a year after I worked on it and started working on Bioshock. So she invited me, Emily Ridgeway invited me to uh, score Bioshock. And that, of course, was a very big game and really was a great opportunity for me to, um, you know, do something unusual and different and creative. And, and people really love that score and the game of course was a huge hit and so that i've, I've been you know scoring games ever since i still do film and tv i'm, I'm back, matter of fact i just finished a film and so I'm, I'm i'm not i don't consider myself a game quote unquote game composer i consider myself a composer for film mm-hmm. tv games uh, but I've, I've done the lion's share of my work in the last decade or so has been for games i would say between TV and games, what are some of the differences between them uh, that stick out in your mind and maybe some of the, the things that you like about uh, one versus the other and vice versa? Well, I mean, they, there's, there's a lot of overlap and then there's differences. The, the main difference is that game music is not linear mm-hmm. in the sense that if a player... I mean, obviously, there's in-game cinematics, so those are linear. But if, if, it, if but gameplay music, you know, a player enters an area and has to battle a boss or whatever, you know, and that can vary in time from one person who maybe can accomplish that goal in 90 seconds, and another person might take seven minutes, you know, so <clears throat> or, or whatever. And so, and, and that's true of mu- much of what gameplay music. Uh, requires, which is it has to be interactive, mm. meaning that the music has to somehow fit what each player is doing. And so that that is the main difference and the main thing that differentiates the two. You know, also, there's other functions that music can um, play in a game where it actually has, you know, a, a real fun- functional requirement which is quite, you know, valuable to, to the game where it can tell you if uh, night or day or if the enemy is close or getting closer or whatever. So it can actually inform the player of important uh, gameplay functions. Um, so on the other hand, the thing that's similar is that they're both using this unique quality of music to, to create mood and, and generate emotional impact and uh, that's something that is, you know, quite the quite the marvelous thing about music that it just has this ability to impact us emotionally. And when it's combined with visual imagery, it can be super powerful and really, really effective. So, um, you know, and, and the thing I love about film and, and indeed that part of 
the games is playing the picture where, you know, mm-hmm. you have a locked, you write music that is locked to picture. And sure. That, I, I really do enjoy that. I have to say, I, I kind of, much of my career was writing to picture. So I still really enjoy that. I love that immediate feedback you get. Um, mm-hmm. Writing game play music. And by the way, like I scored Shadow of War. I mean, I did an hour worth of in-game movies. Mm. So that I was saw like your tweet about movies. that actually with the, the the screenshot of the orchestra. That's really cool. Yeah, it is. And and so uh, that was like an opportunity to like score a, a game and a movie almost, you know, because like so much music to picture. So there, I mean, in, in, you you get that opportunity, but <clears throat> um, the uh, you know the gameplay music is is different, and it in some ways it it's sort of uh, an analog to writing concert music, you know, if, if mm. you into that, because you're you're influenced by the imagery and what's going on, um, but you're not locked to pictures, so you're sort of sort of like influenced by it. So you're writing music to a certain vibe, you know, mm-hmm. and that, and that is done in some concert classical music, you know? So it, it's really, it really sort of, in some ways it, it challenges you more than picture music to picture because you're sort of a slave to the imagery and sure. you're less of a slave to the imagery. You're certainly still writing music for that particular gameplay moment, you know, but it, it, you have more compositional freedom. So it's 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 a very creative um, opportunity, you know. And then of course there's also the interactive techniques like layering and looping and stingers and intros and outros and there's there's some complexity to it that also makes it an interesting challenge. I would say that writing for picture <clears throat> or for um, game. To in with uh, to gameplay, it, it, it's sort of similar, you know. Although with uh, when you're writing to picture, you're always looking and locked to the imagery. When you write gameplay music, you very often get, and I and I say most of the time, you get actual uh, gameplay footage. <clears throat> Somebody plays the game at the developer's uh, studio, and they send you that the uh, gameplay footage so that you you lock that up to your software. And I do use software to write music these days. I, I haven't been writing much. Occasionally, I do write paper and pencil, but more it's within the software. Um, but you you um, you lock up the gameplay footage. So I would say it's sort of similar, excepting with the obviously with the when you're playing the picture, you are really you know absolutely sculpting the music to to fit and and to capture certain changes and emotional you know shifts in the in the in the you know film or television show so that that requires that requires real effort you know it's it's a real challenge to do that um in in games you have less or or, you know a lot less of that quality or or challenge but you're you're still capturing the vibe and feel for it so I, i would say you're still starting with the same um technical toolbox of sounds and et cetera. You, whether you have an orchestra at the end of the process or not, you're, you're starting because everyone that's writing music for film and TV these, and games these days is using software that's allowing you to mock up and to make a really great sounding demo to prove to whoever you're writing music for that it's going to work, that it's mm-hmm. going to be effective and, and sound good and work within the game or the film. So it so so the technical process is very similar. You're you're using the same tools. You the difference is just how how you know tightly you are connected to the imagery and to every nuance of what's going on. Because in gameplay, you're you're really, you're not at all. Mm-hmm. Um, you're really just sort of creating a vibe and not not worrying about any of the details. Because if you did hit something, in other words, if you caught some you know some you know, monster or something being being kicked or something. Uh, it's, that's just a random um, moment. Um, that, sure. that can be caught in gameplay music with stingers and things like that. Mm-hmm. But in general, you're not going to worry about that. And if you if you think you've hit it, um, it's really meaningless because when it gets into the game, <clears throat> that's never going to sync up twice with the you know with with the same with two different players. It's just not not going to happen. So. 
I mean, I, I guess that's my best answer to that. And, and in terms of the workflow, you know, I, as I just mentioned, where I'm using software, one my main software tool is Digital Performer. And with Digital Performer, I can make stuff sound, you know, I mean, it's basically what they call a DAW, digital audio workstation. And I have thousands and thousands and thousands, literally, of sounds and samples and synthesizers and samples of real orchestral instruments, all that's available all the time to me with, on my computer. And I'm basically creating it and making it sound really, really good and then sending it to my, you know, my partners, whoever I'm working with or for on that particular project. When you start a piece, when you sit down um, to uh, to write a piece, do you usually start with a melody in mind, a bass line, a chord progression? Is there some place that you have found throughout your career that you consistently start? That's interesting. That's a good question. I would say more I'm, I'm trying to find a sonic environment that fits. Mm -hmm. And that can be, it, it, it could definitely include a melody or it might just be some harmonies and then you add it, you can add melody to it. It, it may be that there's there's never going to even be a melody, you know. Um, it's going to be more of a sonic environment, you know, but very well may include a melody. So <clears throat> I would say it depends on the project. And, uh, and, and sometimes melody is central. I just wrote something, I can't tell you what it is, but it was for a game. And uh, I've created, I, I created sort of like a, ostinato kind of like an accompaniment figure and then over that i started adding melody so i would say i started with the harmony first and then added melody you know but it can vary and sometimes you're you're working in very dissonant sort of worlds where the melody is quite dissonant and but i would say that the melody sort of comes later to me anyways it doesn't mean that's how everybody works but to me I, I, and 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 i really play with the melody and sort of like um work it you know I, I really finesse it and make changes until the final moment when i'm completely or as happy as i can be with it you know? yeah uh you talked about a sonic atmosphere which i think you uh in the bioshock series you did i mean it's unparalleled the the atmosphere is, that's created there i think that the soundtrack is is very unique because it ranges from uh, melodic and memorable themes all the way to very atonal unsettling stuff to just purely terrifying you know what is happening i'm scared right now especially in the first uh the first and second games how did you convey that vision of some of those crazy sounds that come out of the you know the string sections and the woodwinds like do you notate that do you just tell the orchestra just do crazy things with your bow like how do you communicate that vision um, you know, either through a score or through a sequencer to the orchestra? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, I think what you're talking about is some of those dissonant textures. Um, yeah. Are, there's a technique called aleatoric techniques. Um, and and you, you're you basically, with very specific uh, direction, asking the orchestra to improvise, but, but under very, very uh, specific uh, direction from the composer if you just ask them to do whatever they want you will get sort of chaotic uninteresting sort of you know junk right but you have so you have to really direct them but in within any moment you may say okay you can choose any note within this register and then mm. and then do this or that with it and move it up slowly higher or whatever and so and and so you're really directing the music in a very very um very specific way that, and that is very the most effective way to use those techniques. It's a technique that comes from like the mid late 20th century. And uh, it's, it, it's just really, it, it has, because it's so dissonant, it, it generally is associated with kind of scary, eerie, atmospheric stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but it's really, it really is uh, quite effective. And I thought it was, uh, you know, it took me a while to kind of find the approach, but once I did, that seemed like a really cool and effective technique for Bioshock because, of course, it's a pretty scary world, you know. Yeah. So it it worked. It was very very effective, and yeah. So it, it was. I had to write that out by hand actually, and the the um, studio never heard it until 
I could record that mm. because of the nature of that. There was no way to reproduce it. Some of the, some of the things I could do using samples and detuning them, and there were some samples that sort of existed from sample libraries that did sort of use some of those techniques, you know, but mm -hmm. much of it had to be recorded with live, with real instruments. Can you remember an example of what you had to like instruct, uh, like a specific example of how you instructed the players? Like um, you mentioned, start a start a note in this register and then move it up. Did do you remember like specific things that you had to write out for them to do? Well, I mean, like one technique was uh, a uh, cluster right over, like in, str in the strings, like in the violin section, um, starting around middle C, and I wanted them trilling a trill with a whole step trill, not a half step, but a whole step trill. Hmm. And then, um, and so they could choose any note and I didn't want them to synchronize. So I wanted sort of a cluster. And then I had it glissing up slowly to a next note and then up even further. And, and it kept having like goals and it kept getting higher and higher. So, and, and I, and I, the, and the direction I get, I gave the orchestra, the strings is like a liquidy kind of sound. I wanted the, the strings to have this sort of liquidy kind of, glissando between the, these uh, different points in the register uh, that, that head towards a specific um, area, but that, but I didn't give them a specific note. So it was just mm -hmm. like, this is where you're kind of, you're going. And, and so it was very clustery and, and, and scary and quite effective. So yeah, that would, that had been one of the techniques, you know, that I utilized. That is so cool. Do you remember where that is in the soundtrack? I would love to revisit that to hear that. That's when Steinman, uh, you, you, you know, when you approach uh, that, crazy surgeon yes oh that is very scary that's one of the scariest parts of the whole game i do remember right. that I want to talk real quick before I move on to uh, another topic about the advantages of handwriting scores. So do you think it's uh, a valuable skill to learn to handwrite musical scores? And what does that teach the composer? Yeah, I do think it's valuable. That is how, you know, of course, music was notated for, you know, five, six, seven hundred years. Um, and it and I think it's still it imparts a depth of understanding and knowledge uh, in the, you know, in, in using the orchestra. Um, I, I think of the analogy sometimes uh, of like Picasso, who uh, could early, early in his career was, uh, could create really almost photorealistically gorgeous traditional painting, you know, mm -hmm. um, but then later abstract, you know, abstracted it and, and yeah. got away from that. So in, in a way, I think that having sort of abstracting your music from the tradition, I think you need to know the tradition first, you know, mm -hmm. um, you can't, you can't abstract from nothing. So I think that's the, uh, that's the value of that. And, and then also it just sort of, it, it, it creates a, a sort of, um, uh, discipline in your knowledge and uh, just, I think, very much deepens your understanding of how music functions and how, how harmonies work. So um, that said, there's a number of extraordinarily successful composers who can't do that. You know, Hans Zimmer and Danny Elfman and, and a few others who really have no, no notation skills, cannot read music, you know. Hmm. So I, I, that said, I believe that having those skills is is valuable. It, in this day and age, however, it does not um, mean that you cannot be successful. Um, mm -hmm. When I first started, you could not have started a career as a film and TV composer unless you could write music. Sure. You know, but nowadays I, that has changed. That said, I think it's valuable to have those skills. And I think that, I mean, we, we're definitely in an era of synthesizers and sound, um, sort of uh, uh, soundscapes mm -hmm. um, that are not traditionally musical in terms of like, you know, that doesn't, I mean, there certainly are exceptions, lots of exceptions, but there's a lot of the scores these days are just sort of, you know, sound soundscapes. Right. That said, yeah. those, those things are pretty easy to, to do. I mean, they're, I'm not saying that they're, they're 
uh, they're, they're easy because you still have to fit the picture. But um, the thing that makes a composer, th those any any composer can do those if you have the tools and you buy the, the sample libraries and the and the uh, and the synth synths etc. But having the traditional skills, I think, is what elevates you, and mm -hmm. so that you can do both. You know, so that you can and and I and I just think you know there's going to be a come a time when those tools have gotten so powerful that a director or a sound designer can create the score you know if that's all you are wanting, wanting to achieve just sort of sure. a, you know then then those those tools will exist shortly so I think it's really to your advantage to be able to to write traditional music you know mm -hmm. and to write a good melody and that's what people still remember right. more than anything is a good strong melody and harmonies and you know and, and understanding rhythms etc that's still going to I think remain um uh, an important strength for a composer. Speaking of tradition, who are some of your biggest influences uh, in the classical world and who might you recommend people who are new to the orchestra to listen to? Well, I mean, for the last 10 years or so, my favorite composer has been Gustav Mahler. Okay. Mahler is not a composer that one associates with film music because it's like late romantic, but it's just his music to me is just so amazing. I'm a huge Mahler fan. Um, certainly, I love 20th century music, especially early, mid 20th century music. So Bartok and Shostakovich and Prokofiev and Stravinsky and um, composers like that are, I'm, I'm a huge, huge fan, of, especially Bartok and Prokofiev. But others as well. That's just such, such a fascinating era for um, concert for concert music. And for as far as film composers, Jerry Goldsmith was a huge favorite of mine. I met, mm. I got to meet Jerry and attend some of his sessions. A huge influence on me. I love his music. Um, Bernard Herrmann, of course, um, and the, maybe the greatest of all film composers, uh, John Williams. Mm -hmm. um, he, I, I think. And there, you know, others, some might disagree with me, but I just think there's no one, no one's career. And I go, went all the way back to the beginning of film music in the 1930s, early 1930s. Um, there's just no one like him. He was, he is and remains. He's still, he's still a working composer in his 80s. Uh, like maybe to, to my ear, the greatest film composer ever. And he's a concert. He's more than that. He's, he's just a part of the musical scene that's just um, so unique. So yeah, he he's a, a super influence. I mean, James Newton Howard and Danny Elfman and composers like that <clears throat> are super, super uh, strong influences on me and I love their music. And and other, I mean, com con other contemporary uh, classical composers, George Crumb, um, I don't know, it, too numerous almost to mention. If you go into the the aleatoric stuff like Penderecki and Ligeti and oh, oh of course um, 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 the music of John Crickliano. I'm a huge fan of John Crickliano's music. He's an, also an Academy Award winner winning film composer for the Red Violin, but his music is spectacular, and I, I'm just a huge fan of his concert music as well as his film music. Well, thank you so much for those recommendations. Also, for anybody listening. If they follow you on Twitter, I noticed when you like a YouTube video, it shows up in your Twitter. So as I, I followed you, I was scrolling down. I saw a bunch of different things I need to listen to here because uh, I see that you like uh, Dmitry Shostakovich. I, I, I've i actually uh, I'm glad I, I pronounced that correctly. I've never heard of that before, and I almost just totally butchered it. Um, but fantastic. OK, that's that's quite a lot of artists to check out. Uh, great, great 20th century composers. He was a. Soviet era composer and you know suffered a lot in, in Russia at that time, especially during World War II and under Stalin. But really a spectacular composer. And there was there actually there was a film that recently came out called The Death of Stalin, and the composer they hired did kind of a Shostakovich-ish score, and it was quite effective. You know, that's really cool. Well, I'll definitely have to check that out, and I'll put links to all those people in the show notes of this show. So going back to kind of your composition process or where ideas come from, I'm, all, I'm very fascinated as well by the, the science of creativity and how creative people can continue to be creative and continue to create um, uh, over and over and over. 
when or where do you usually get your best ideas? Well, um, that's a good question. I mean, the best ideas come from just really hard, focused work. Um, so it, 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 once you start really focusing in on the project and, and, and deadlines, I mean, I joke that, that my inspiration is deadlines, you know, but it's actually, there's actually, it's not actually a joke. It actually is quite <laughs> bad. Right. Yeah. A certain deadline. You know, if you have, if you have an, uh, like, yeah, oh, we need it sometime soon. Whenever you get around to writing oh, that, yeah. it's not very inspirational. Never going to happen. And, and yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, inspiration can occur at different times or whatever. But when you are forced to really think and focus on something, ideas start to come. And so really com complete, um, you know, uninterrupted focus on a particular musical need or goal. And then ideas, even if you start with something simplistic and uh, banal, it can, it can metastasize, <laughs> it's not a good word, yeah, it can yeah. become something quite interesting, sure. as sort of like uh, molded, and then you don't even recognize the original idea at the end, you know, but it was just like a starting place. I remember I had a, a, a teacher at USC, and he was a piano, piano teacher, but he was also a film composer, Bernardo Segal. But Bernardo would say to me, because we, because I ended up wanting to talk more about film composing with him than, than <laughs> playing the piano, although I, I did play the piano. Um, and he would say, you know, start with anything. Just just start with some really simple idea, and then the ideas will flow. And that always stuck with me, and I, I just really think that's that's the truth, you know. Um, there are situations where the, the um, schedule can be so intense that, you know, you're working – without sleep and that, that I find that to be really problematic because if I don't have enough sleep, my, I start to lose focus and my, my better ideas do not come to me Same. At three in the morning after I've been up all day. So I try to get a good night's sleep. And then I, and I, and I also like to work first thing in the morning. If you, if you can come up with an idea the night before, even if just the beginnings of something, and then you get up in the morning and you have some starting point, mm -hmm. that's a really good time to start writing music. Is there something to be said about coming up with an idea before you sleep and, and sleeping on it? Because I have heard. Yeah, yeah, that's what I just and that's what I was just really just saying. Mm -hmm. Come up with an idea just before you go to sleep um, and then you and then sleep on it. Yeah. And, and as a matter of fact, I like to if I have an idea and, I, and I'm excited about it, I like to as I'm going to sleep, I like to take a, a few moments and think about the idea and sort of suggest, you know, I'm going to come up with and give yourself some self suggestion. I'm going to come up with a solution for this in the morning and think about it and kind of parse it a few different ways in your head. And, and yeah, you, you, you do answer musical questions in your sleep. So you're a film scoring, a film scoring instructor at USC. So I'm sure this should be a, a fairly easy question for you. You probably get questions like this all the time. So let's take, me someone who's a younger dude who doesn't know much about the orchestra but i have uh, i do have a knowledge of music theory and i come from like a folk background singer songwriter you know play the acoustic guitar but i'm hungry to learn more about the orchestra and orchestrate like you gary Scheinman. what would you do or or sort of what road would you send me down to get to that point obviously uh you know you've got several years of talent experience and and work you know, under your belt. So I, I'm not expecting to be a master, but if you wanted to send me on that path, where, you know, where would you start me? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think I would start you by um, having you listen to a lot of really good music and, you know, and study traditional composition, orchestration, counterpoint. So the foundation foundations of, uh, of writing music, you know, um, and these days, as much as, as those foundations, it's critically important to have mastered the technology, learn to use mm -hmm. the, the technological tools. But if you want to write really the deeper sort of ideas and music, I think you need to kind of, um, in fall in love with classical music. I mean, if it, 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 not everybody will, you know, I mean, but certainly film composers, I mean, if you, John Williams and Jerry Goldsmith, those guys loved classical music. And we're very influenced on our, well, John Williams remains influenced by it. So, it, so it's really valuable. You know, it's like if you want to paint, 
and going back to that analogy, then you, you want to know what the masters look like and then, you know, take it from there, take your own, your own, um, you know, curve and, or, or your own path. But, um, so I, I would suggest, you know, studying, you know, learn how, what an orchestra score, an orchestral score looks like, you know, how the ranges of the instruments, um, all, all the sorts of traditional tools. And that does require, I mean, if you're self-motivated, fine, you can, you can find that in books and you can find lots of information online. But if you're not, then it might be valuable to, to go to a school and actually study it, you know? Mm-hmm. So that's what I would say. If you want to write for orchestra, you, and, and to do so effectively, you should have some some tools. That said, I mean, there's guys like Hans Zimmer that never did, you know, mm-hmm. just sort of went by the seat of his pants and has been extraordinarily successful, you know. So there's always, you know, there's always uh, exceptions to that rule. But I don't know how else I would have done it. I don't think I could have done what Hans did without studying music and and finding stuff. And my music doesn't sound like Hans's music, and his doesn't sound like mine. So I mean, everybody has their own unique path. I think Hans definitely listened to. I mean, he he really does know classical music. When uh, I, I I've met Hans a few times, and um, and not only heard him personally, but I've heard him interviewed. And he like, he talks about um, concert composers and his and how how he his music. Uh, um, it was influenced by certain composers. And so he's quite literate in that sense. He may not not be able to write a score, but he kind of knows what it sounds like, you know, and Mm -hmm. he can kind of emulate that or he can find any, he can find help if he, if need be to help him, you know, to achieve certain um, complex classical orchestrations. He can just hire orchestrators to help him do that. Or he, maybe he will find even other composers. So, um, so that's what I would say. I would say, you know, get get some traditional skills and at the same time, get your technical skills under under your belt so that you know how to use a DAW like Logic or DP for that matter, or, or some of the others, mm-hmm. <clears throat> Pro Tools. And, uh, you know, and start to purchase libraries and, and building up your your ability to, you know, create a, something that that uh, that sounds, you know, it sounds good and sounds and and start to start to write start writing a lot of music. I mean, it's critical ultimately to any composer to write a whole shitload of music. Sorry for mm-hmm. my, you know, English there, but uh, oh no, no, please write, go ahead, feel free to write a lot of music because the more you write, and the more you write that that you will end up liking, and other people go, wow, that works. That that's really effective. The better you're going to get at it. Are there any? principles of orchestration um, that you have found to be true over the course of your career? And the answer could be no, because I know the rules are always broken by the next guy that comes along, you know, when you look at the classical era of music. And so I'm just curious if there's any general principles of orchestration that you, you know, try to teach your students or that you have found to be that you found to be true throughout your career. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think orchestration is almost like um, painting with colors. It's like filling in, you know, it's, it's like painting. I, I like that analogy, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it, it, you are using uh, sonic colors. And uh, um, I mean, I, I, I don't know that I've found any unique orchestration path. Uh, and yet I know that my music has a certain sound to it. You know, um, one of the things that, I do, and I and I actually a lot of composers do now. Is we add in samples with the mix of mm-hmm. the live orchestra, and uh, and so sometimes with the samples you can do things that a real orchestra can't do. Right. Um, but that's okay. It's okay, especially for film music or t- or game music, it, it, if it's effective, and, and then the samples just become part of the whole sonic fabric in the final mix. And so um, you might have some really great horn sample that can play really fast passage that, you know, that you double with the fast strings, but you could never get horn players to do that. But because mm-hmm. it's a sample, it has no problem doing it whatsoever, you know? Mm-hmm. And so um, you're never going to have the horns try to replace that. You're just going to use the sample. You can have the horns do something more horn-like, you know? So that, that wouldn't be a particularly horn-like 
idea, but it works. It is some. It is cool and it's effective. And and so that that's I think from my perspective totally within the rules. You know, um, uh, something you would not do for concert music, but something you would do for for uh, classical music or for film uh, or, or scoring it does not have to be like a orchestral score where where it's all playable. So yeah, I mean, there's things things that I certain things that I use. And, and of course, there's synthesizers or whatever. So, you know, I would say um, I like to I still like to study scores and look at how other composers um, use the orchestra, particularly great orchestrators like uh, Mahler or Maurice Ravel or, or, or Prokofiev or whatever. Mm-hmm. Those guys were masters with the orchestra. And so it's really valuable to look at how they achieved what they what they did and then you, you just sort of imbibe that and it becomes part of your brain and then when you start to orchestrate you, you might get an idea like wow he doubled that with a flute an octave above mm-hmm. and that let me let me try that and one of the great things about having this technology that's at our fingertips is you can try things orchestrationally yeah. and go well, that that was a bad idea and then you just erase it you know it goes <laughs> right so you can actually hear it and go, yeah, that's cool, or yeah, that was not, not such a good idea. Um, and so that is one of the great things that we didn't have when I first started, and certainly over the hundreds of years until this technology made this possible. Um, you know, we have this sort of magical ability to emulate an orchestra and listen and go, yeah, that's cool, or nah, not so much. You know, and that's that's a really cool thing. That is, it, it is, and it, and it permits a lot of experimenting with orchestration that would have been very difficult to do. You would have had to do it in your mind's ear, so to say. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And uh, and then when the orchestra, and I remember in the old days, you know, you you'd write something and you'd play it at the piano and go, I think that'd be really cool to have the horn do that. And then I'll, and then you get to the session, and it wasn't such a good idea. And then you go, mm-hmm. okay, don't. Don't play bars thirty-seven and thirty-eight horns. Thank you, and and then it's gone. You know. Yeah. But um, now I get to really test it out, <laughs> and that's really a really cool, cool thing. When it comes to the other genres of of video game music, like we talked about, a lot of the the synthesis, a lot of some of the hybrid stuff, where it's orchestral elements mixed with other elements. Do you have any interest in expanding out on that or what are your thoughts on those kind of more electronic, you know, uh, there's been a big resurgence of, of like chip tune, you know, uh, like oh, six, yeah. 16 bit and 32 bit uh, music written in the style of some of the old, you know, Nintendo games. What are your thoughts on that style of video game music? Well, there's two questions there. One is using synthesizers to sort of enhance the orchestral score, the hybrid and I do do that. I do that very much now. And I and with the with the film score I did, I would say a good third of it is synths, and then the other two thirds are orchestral and style. And sometimes it's half synths or even more. So I, I definitely ha- have included synthesizers into my process, and I and I think that they make very unique, very cool sounds that you can't do with live orchestra. Mm-hmm. And it's a, it is the, it is very much the it sound right now. You know, I mean, it's, it's the in. Thing. And so you want sure. your your clients want stuff that sounds, you know, sounds like that. So you almost are in some respect, you're sort of like you need to be able to include that as part of this. That's the sound of today, you know, um, not in every score, but in a lot of them. Um, in terms of chip tunes, I mean, I'll leave that to others. I don't really want to write that stuff. That's um, and, and there's nothing, nothing wrong with it. It's just not particularly interesting to me. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So. I think, and, and and yet I know there's people out there, especially young composers, who love that stuff and like that's fantastic. You know, go for it. It's just not my thing. And I think you've built you've built yourself as having this skill set and being really prolific around an orchestra. And I think that that's what makes you you know a sought after composer. Uh, speaking of which. Um, what do you think you, you mentioned your individual style? And I know we all have different styles because we're all unique humans, obviously, as composers. But what do you think you bring to the table for your film, TV and game projects that other composers don't? Or that maybe separates you or sets you apart from other composers? 
I think I just think I have my own voice. I have and and if you listen to my music, it, it's it's a pretty wide palette of stuff. You know, like my most recent uh, two scores um, from the film and from a game, a virtual reality game coming out called Torn. You know, um, I, I can write in many different styles, and I actually love being challenged to continue continually try different things. So I bring like a a, a, a long experience of writing in different styles, having a lot of experience working with orchestras, you know, and some, and just a usual, an unusual or a unique, you know, um, approach when challenged to write something that sounds, you know, different from the mainstream of what you hear. Um, I think if, if you wanted a score that, that was outside of the paradigm that everybody's writing in, I think I could can do that quite nicely. And, and it doesn't mean that I can't write within the paradigm either, you know, I can, but I, I really like being challenged. And I think Bioshock or Dante's Inferno or, or even um, Shadow of Mortar or Shadow of War, it had those elements in it, you know, that were that were unique um, uh, and make makes my music different from other composers. It doesn't mean they're wrong or I'm right. It just means you, you're gonna get, if you like what I've, what I've done, you know, then um, hire, you know, even if you have something different, I would say if I was talking to potential clients, you know, hire me to to experiment, you know, and give me some breathing space. And, you know, and, and best of all is when they if, if whoever is hiring you has a very unique project, something that looks and feels different from the mainstream. I love those kind of challenges. So I think, you know, I mean, I'm not saying I'm unique in the in, in that sense of uh, you know, I want a unique um, opportunity on a really quality project, but um, I, I just I just put my own kind of I think hopefully valuable experience and sensibility that would be quite quite worthwhile bringing aboard. You know, I'm, I sound like my agent right now. <laughs> well, that's probably good that you uh, you advocate for yourself the same way your agent would. Um, I'm curious when it comes to gigs, what is, what is a bad fit for you for a gig where something, you know, some, someone or something dons your door and, and you just know that it's, you know, there's a red flag there. Cause I usually ask composers, you know, how, how to get gigs, but I, I have a feeling that you haven't had to, you know, you haven't had to struggle for gigs for a while now. So I, I kind of thought I'd shift it and ask. Um, for you, when do you say no? This is this is not a good fit for me. Well, I think if someone came to me and said, you know, we want a hip hop score, <laughs> yeah, I would say, you know, right. that's probably not <laughs> my strongest. Have you suit. listened to my music? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that said, I do hear a lot of hip hop music because my son really likes it. He's seventeen. Okay. When we drive places, we drive one way out, we listen to his music, and the other way back, we listen to my music. That's a good compromise. It's That's awesome. More classical, you know, which he doesn't love. Although I used to take him to the symphony. Uh, he used to really like it, but he's since become disinterested. But maybe someday he'll he'll fall in love with it again. I don't know. But in any event, so I would if if it just if just the style that they wanted just was totally uninteresting to me, or I just felt like, you know, you, there's people who really can do hip hop that it'd be like, really, you know, so, or me or check me, you know, you're talking about 8-bit music. I'd say yeah, there's other composers that would be better for that. Now, if someone insisted, I, I could bring somebody aboard, you know, who could help me with that, you know, and then mm -hmm. I could bring my sensibility. But I would just generally say, you know, go give somebody else the opportunity to do that, you know? Yeah. Or if, or, if, or if the project was just really not very good, mm -hmm. you know, it was just really terrible. Yeah. I, might, I wouldn't say, you know, this is crap, but I'd say, you know, this doesn't quite feel right for me. Sure. Um, I might indeed and have in fact said that on a couple of projects. Um, so you know, on the other hand, if they offered me like fabulous money, I might say, I find a way to like it. Right, uh, right, right. But if it's like if the money's not there and the, the project's terrible, then then just say no to it. You know. Yeah. 
How does your son feel about the fact that you've scored all these video games? Is he a gamer? Does he talk about his friends? Like, yeah, my dad did Bioshock. Yeah, I think, I think he appreciates me. You know, he's come to <laughs> my sessions. You know, he doesn't. I mean, it's not like he's in awe of me or anything. His right, just, right. Yeah, yeah. You know, but he certainly appreciates that. And I think his friends are, you know, are kind of like, I think it's cool that his dad does writes game music, especially games if they know the game. Some of them sure. don't. You know, some of them know Bioshock, and other ones have never heard of it. You know, or yeah, yeah, or Shadow of Mordor. You know, it just depends on the. There's so much stuff coming at us these days. It's like a fire sure. hose of films and television shows and games, and it's like I don't even know a lot of stuff that's that's out. You know, so it's like it's it's kind of an overwhelming amount of stuff in the world that we're we're being enticed to play and watch, et cetera. So sure. Um, Fortnite yeah, no, cool. seems to be cool the new thing I, with the kids. I, I think my son appreciates what I did. Yeah. If I was going to say Fortnite seems to be the new cool thing with the kids. Have you, have you heard of that? I Fortnite? Have yes, it's huge. It's, that's a very, very successful game. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty wild. The whole battle Royale thing. Cause I'm, I'm 28 and I feel like I can't even stay, you know, I can't stay ahead of the trend nowadays. Um, so I got two more questions for you. Thank you so much okay. for taking the time out. I really sure. appreciate it. Um, the first is if you could send a message to yourself. So if you could kind of communicate with past Gary as he was first getting into the film scoring business or just making music to picture, what would you tell him? What advice would you give him? You know, I, I was asked this recently about a year ago, and I actually... I think I would have given a different answer before that, but actually this, this is really the thing that I would have loved to have known years ago because it's, it is such a competitive industry and it's, and it's, and it's an insecure industry and you never know, um, am I going to be, am I going to achieve my goals? I would have said to myself, Gary, it's going to be okay. You're, you're going <laughs> to find a way to make a living and it's, and you're going to really enjoy this career. It's going to be okay. You don't have to be so stressed. Yeah. Worrying. I mean, that just knowing that, you know, it's like knowing it's like if you're going into war, you'd like to know, am I going to get out of this alive? That would kind of make make it yeah. a little more <laughs> tolerable. <laughs> so it would, it would have been nice to know that, that it was going to be OK. I think that would be truly the, the best advice I could. And then I could there's certainly a lot of other advice I could give myself, including, you know, buy Apple stock in the year 2000. Um, <laughs> right. Of, yes, absolutely. I'm there with you. I'm in the same boat. Under hundred percent, hundred percent. So another, the last question I want to ask you is what do you, uh, you know, this could be creatively or just professionally or you know, whatever, ha whatever's happening in your life. What's, um, what's making you excited lately or what are you looking forward to? Well, that's a good question. Um, I'm working on a game right now and I'm really enjoying it. I, I enjoy the process, you know, I enjoy like the, the thing that, that thrills me is writing cool music. So like, Whatever the project is, if I've written something that really is, I, I really like that day, I feel really good. I mean, that's like, that's very heady feeling when yeah. you've just like written something, you go, wow, that's cool. That's, I love that, you know? And then you get feedback from the people you're working with, you know, and you go like, man, that's, they love it, you know? That's, that's fantastic. There's nothing better. Um, yeah, there is just really nothing. That is, that is an, an awesome feeling. Um, obviously, um, if, if some really, really cool game or film or television opportunity presented itself, that would be really, really, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm enjoying the one I'm on right now, but um, uh, some some really, really cool, you know, project, and not not even necessarily with tons of money, just, just really creative. That's, I think, mm. more than anything, that's what motivates me these days. It's like something where you have really passionate, um, company company that's whether a developer or a production company that's made something that they just believe in and love and it's like you know and you're challenged and you know you you have to work hard at it to find the answer you know to I'm on bioshock it took me a long time to find the right direction on that but mm -hmm. once i found it it was like an aha kind of moment and including for you know emily was like yes that's the bioshock sound you know, so I mean, that's that's like the best, you know. So I, I hope that I I do get those sorts of things. I mean, I'm not I'm not going to be climbing Mount Everest or anything, um, 
or challenging myself in that respect. So it's really kind of creative challenges, you know. That and I, you know, I enjoy my my life outside of music as well. But definitely from a creative perspective, just being challenged with stuff really made by really passionate mm. um, creators, you know, that's the best. Well, uh, Gary, you have sold the craft very well, and I think uh, you've inspired me, so I'm sure anybody who's listening to this, you've inspired as well. I just want to thank you again so much uh, for taking the time out to talk. I know we went a little long, but I think there's so much value uh, in just a lot of wisdom here, so thank you so much. If you enjoy these interviews and want to support the podcast, honestly, the best way to do that is just to share this episode with a friend. Now, if you want to be a real mensch, you can rate the podcast on iTunes, which really helps, goes a long way for visibility. If you're listening on the Apple Podcast app, just scroll down and tap the number of stars you think the podcast deserves. Follow me on Twitter at Matt Kenyon Music and let me know what you think of the show. Until then, you've been listening to Composer Code, the podcast dedicated to helping you, dear listener, succeed as a video game composer. Take care.